For Jennifer Perjo's mom and stepdad, their worst nightmare became their reality when they stepped foot into their home one evening to find their daughter lifeless on the floor. At 8.30 p.m. on April 4, 1994, Georgia and Mick McNear pulled up to their home in Magnolia, New Jersey. Mick was all chipper because he bought a new location for his auto body shop and it was time to celebrate. But when he and Georgia looked at the outside of their home, something seemed off. All of the lights were off, which was weird considering their 16-year-old daughter Jennifer was supposed to be there. They thought it could have been a power outage, but all of their neighbor's lights were still on. So maybe Jennifer was just asleep or something. With that, Georgia and Mick decided to go inside. They entered through the side door. Mick put his bag on the kitchen counter and turned on the lights. He looked over and saw Jennifer lying on the carpet in a pool of red fluid. Her body was cold to the touch and covered in puncture wounds. Mick grabbed Georgia and told her to go outside. She screamed outside begging for someone to revive Jennifer, but unfortunately it was too late. The police arrived at the scene shortly thereafter and confirmed Jennifer was indeed lifeless. There weren't any signs of intimate physical harm, so the R word was off the motive table. The authorities determined four plastic containers were missing from a shelf in Georgia and Mick's room. The containers held $200 to $300 worth of Susan B. Anthony coins and $5 bills. Based on the money thing, the police thought it could have been a robbery gone wrong, but they didn't see any signs of forced entry, which doesn't make sense, unless the intruder knew Jennifer or was let in by her. It was also a nice day outside, so there was a possibility that Jennifer left the door open. An autopsy was performed where the medical examiner concluded Jennifer sustained at least 20 puncture wounds to her neck and chest from a small blade such as a pocket knife. She had a serious injury to the head from a glass beer mug that was found at the scene. What ended it all was an unknown binding the assailant tightened around Jennifer's neck to throttle her. Jennifer didn't go down without a fight though. There were several defensive wounds on Jennifer's hands that suggested she blocked some of her attacker's blows. Based on the crime scene findings, Jennifer fought the assailant in several parts of the home, including the living room and kitchen. They believe she injured her attacker with broken pieces of the glass mug before the final hit. In the beginning stages of the investigation, the authorities had no real leads and no one knew who would have wanted to do something so horrific to Jennifer. They assumed the attacker would have a lot of cuts from these glass pieces, so they were all like, keep an eye out for people with suspicious scrapes. Gee, that's helpful. What kid doesn't have bruises or scrapes? At the time of her passing, Jennifer, or Ginny, was a sophomore at Sterling High School. She played saxophone in the band, was on the color guard, and was a beast at track. She was on the varsity track team her freshman year, which was practically unheard of. Jennifer's classmates and team members had nothing but nice things to say about her. When Jennifer moved to New Jersey in the fifth grade, they said she was pretty shy. Over the years, she became very outgoing and excelled in school. Outside of school, she was pretty active at church and enjoyed helping her stepdad with his race cars. She loved loved the color purple, even in the form of purple cabbage on salads, and had a great relationship with her family. While most teenage girls fight with and rebel against their moms, Jennifer was super close with her mom, Georgia. They loved spending time together. On the morning of the crime, Jennifer woke up early to get to track practice, which was a normal practice according to Jennifer's coach and classmates. At the time, Jennifer's school was on spring break, so she went home after practice. At 3 p.m., Georgia called Jennifer to see how her daughter was doing. About an hour later, Georgia called Jennifer again to talk about their dinner plans. Georgia wanted to make spaghetti and meatballs for dinner, and she asked Jennifer to start thawing the meat and boil a pot of water for the pasta closer to dinner time. That way, it would be super easy and quick to cook everything. Jennifer agreed, and she and Georgia said they loved each other before hanging up. That was the last time Georgia would ever speak to her daughter. At 5 p.m., Jennifer talked to a school friend on the phone. During the phone call, the friend mentioned hearing someone knock on Jennifer's door. Jennifer apparently opened the door, and it was a man asking for Georgia and Mick. She told them they weren't home and then closed the door. Shortly after that, Jennifer mentioned seeing the man hanging around the cul-de-sac, which she found strange. Sometime between 6 and 6.30 p.m., a neighbor reported seeing Jennifer sitting on the front steps of her house. This was the last time she was seen alive. Georgia called Jennifer a little after this to let her know she and Mick were on their way home, but Jennifer didn't answer. And, well, you know the rest. Over the next few days, investigators conducted interviews with Jennifer's neighbors, friends, and family members. None of the neighbors reported hearing any unusual noises, which is interesting because they lived in a neighborhood where the houses were pretty close together. Jennifer's friend, who she spoke on the phone with that evening, told the police about the man that came to the door. With no other hot leads, he became the main suspect in the case. Detectives already assumed Jennifer's attacker wasn't a stranger, but rather someone who knew her parents. The guy at the door specifically asked for the parents, so he at least knew who they were. And any friend of the McNairs knew Georgia was a bartender and Mick often kept cash arounds from his automotive shop, which meant there was always money in the house. This became the theorized motive. But for $200 worth of coins? Seems a little weak. 
Maybe the intruder thought there was more money in the house? At one point, the detectives tried to track down the missing coins, but it was practically impossible due to how often these coins were used in New Jersey at the time. There was one close call, though. One time, a guy covered in scratches came into a bar shortly after the incident. He paid for his bill in Susan B. Anthony coins. Patrons and employees were suspicious of the man, so they held him there until the police arrived. The police questioned this dude, but found no evidence that connected him to Jennifer's case. Even with DNA evidence from the scene, the coins, and the tidbit of information from Jennifer's friend, the police had no luck in identifying the perp. Years later, it was revealed that Jennifer referred to the man as an old family friend when she was on the phone with her classmate. But still, nothing. Georgia and Mick ended up moving away because it was too much to live in the house where they found their lifeless daughter. Yeah, I bet. Broken hearts, they moved to Lawnside, but remained active in Jennifer's case, checking in with the detectives on leads and keeping Jennifer's memory alive through candlelight vigils and fundraisers. One time, Georgia and Mick hired a psychic in 1997 in hopes they'd find more about what happened to their daughter. The psychic believed Jennifer was attacked by two teenage boys who were sent by a girl who thought Jennifer was trying to get with her boyfriend. Investigators exhausted this theory, but found no reason to believe there was any truth to it. Although Jennifer had recently broken up with her boyfriend before the incident, there was no evidence that suggested she was connected to any other guys romantically. And for those curious, the police cleared Jennifer's ex as a suspect in the beginning stages of the investigation. In 1998, the authorities finally had a suspect, the McNear's old neighbor, Steve, the same neighbor who opened up his home to the grieving parents on the night of the crime. Steve definitely fit the bill. He was a close family friend, knew the McNears had cash in their home, and was someone Jennifer would open up the door to. But how wrong would it be that he let the parents stay at his home after just slaying their daughter? That gives me the shivers. Fortunately, not much was publicly stated by the authorities about their investigation of Steve. They actually didn't even name him. The parents did. That being said, it is believed that DNA tests were conducted, and since Steve was never charged, it's safe to say he wasn't a match. And just like that, it was back to square one. Years passed, and Jennifer's case remained cold. The only advancement made in the case was the announcement that detectives believe the crime could have been carried out by a group of assailants. Not just one. What a profound discovery. It wasn't until 2013 that another suspect was named. But before that, both Mick and Georgia passed away. Mick in 2007 and Georgia in 2009. Mick and Georgia left this world without knowing who did this to their daughter. The last several years of their lives were emotionally exhausting to say the least, and it's just heartbreaking that they didn't get any sort of closure. In an interview she did shortly before passing away, Georgia stated she knew she wouldn't live to see the day her daughter's assailant was arrested, let alone identified. She had some peace of mind knowing that the last thing she said to her daughter was, I love you. But that didn't make up for the grief of losing Jennifer. So I don't think I mentioned this earlier, but Jennifer had an older sister named Carol. Before Georgia passed away, Carol promised her mother that she would do everything in her power to bring justice to Jennifer. And since both parents passed away, Carol has really taken charge of forwarding Jennifer's case, raising money for the cause, and continuing to spread the word. Fast forward to 2013. That May, Carol did an interview where she stated her theory that a man named Scott David Ross was responsible for her sister's demise. She said her parents, Mick and Georgia, believe this to be true as well. So who is Scott Ross? One of Mick's employees at the body shop. He was like a son to Mick. Carol stated she believed Scott was a guy who knocked on the door that day for many reasons, one being the black eye he had at Jennifer's funeral. Could that have been an injury Jennifer made while fighting back? Turns out, Scott was labeled a person of interest in the case. He and his brother had been interviewed in the past and apparently gave DNA samples, which weren't a match. Around the time Carol publicly stated her Scott did it theory, the authorities made plans to interview Scott again. That's when they found out Scott recently lost his life to an overdose, which complicated this case even more. The detectives hold firm to their theory that the crime was committed by a group of people. With this theory, that means Scott very well could have been involved, even without being a match to the DNA. If there were two or three people, the DNA could have belonged to one of the others. But after almost 30 years since Jennifer's murder, the case remains unsolved. No arrests have been made, no other suspects have been stated, and Jennifer's family and friends are forced to go through life without any closure. Carol said in an interview, it feels like a story that I've just been talking about year after year. Then it hits me that it's my life, it's my sister. 20 years later, I still can't believe this happened to our family. Carol continues to push detectives to take actionable steps in finding justice for her sister, and even created an online petition to encourage them further. She said she will never give up on Jennifer's case, and when she passes away, she knows her kids will continue the fight for her as well. Jennifer's biological dad, Mark, has come to terms with the fact that he'll most likely meet his demise without knowing who did this to his daughter, just like Georgia and Mick. This case has gone on longer than she had lived, Mark said in an interview.
Dang, that really puts things into perspective. But Mark started the Jennifer Persia Memorial Scholarship in 1996, the year his daughter would have graduated. This scholarship gives Mark a little peace knowing a deserving student is getting a gift in Jennifer's name. Camden County Prosecutor Sergeant Patricia Tulane stated the case is still being investigated by her and Sergeant Joe Verduro, who went to school with Jennifer back in the day. A $15,000 reward is being offered for information leading to an arrest and conviction for Jennifer's case. If you have information relating to the case, please contact Patricia or email ccpotips at ccprosecutor.org. This was a senseless act carried out by a sick person or group of people, and it's terrible to think that someone could do this over some Tupperware containers of coins. Whatever the reason, I can tell you it was not worth robbing sweet Jennifer of her life. My heart goes out to Jennifer's friends and family, and I hope this video can continue to spread awareness. If you have any theories about this case or suggestions of other unsolved cases you think we should cover, please leave a comment down below. Until next time, stay safe, be aware, and tell your friends and family you love them. Thanks for watching, everyone.